I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my daily life living in the beautiful tropical country of Nicaragua. Today, I want to talk about that emotional feeling that you have when you're starting to consider should you move to a new country? Should you become a digital nomad? Should you become an expat? Should you look at moving abroad and, and exploring a life abroad? And you have this feeling that you want to dip your toe into the waters and test it out. See if you like it. See if it's going to work for you. Well, I have some advice about that, and I think it's not what you're expecting. So let's talk about that right after that bump. We have a post-rain sun coming out, but I don't know how long it's going to last. I have to do my videos in between the showers because we've got like a one-week continuous rain situation going on, which is absolutely, absolutely beautiful. We've really needed it, so that's fantastic. Okay, so I was talking to one of you guys just yesterday, and he said, oh, I'm really interested in Nicaragua. This is looking great, and I, but I, you know, I'm looking at maybe renting a low-cost apartment. Can I get it for a few months at a time? Or you're just looking at different rental options, right? And and his idea was he wants to stay in his home country, keep working, but dip his toe into the idea of becoming a digital nomad or possibly a full-time expat abroad in Nicaragua in this case, but that's not really important. And uh, so he was thinking, you know, maybe he could do this. And, and I said, well, you know, really, this is something you need to think about very carefully because the idea of dipping your toe in actually will potentially, potentially give you bad information. It will not give you the benefits that you think it will. And it may give you misleading information. So it doesn't lead you to a good decision uh, at the end of the day. And it may just not make sense. So I want to talk about this. So first of all, let's back up. It is important if you're looking at moving abroad and you're thinking, hey, I may want to move to, we'll just name a place. Thailand. I heard great things about Thailand. It seems fantastic. I'm just going to pack up and move. I recommend generally, unless you're an experienced traveler who is truly adventurous like I am, don't do that. That is an incredibly reckless thing to do. And the chances that you're going to get to a new country and go, wow, this is not what I was expecting is pretty high. It's very dangerous to do that. So it's generally best. Now, there are exceptions, and I have done this time and time and time again. Uh, most of the places that I've moved to, either I've been in very little or not at all. For example, I moved to Greece. I moved to Romania. I moved to Ukraine. I moved to Nicaragua. I moved to Panama, all sight unseen. I did move to Spain and and Italy, having uh, visited briefly previously, but very briefly. Okay, but so it's important to generally, under normal circumstances, visit a country, and normally this isn't too big of a deal. So let's just say you're you're really thinking about Thailand, and Thailand is an important example because it's so far away. Nicaragua, you should come if you're thinking about Nicaragua. Look, the flights are like a hundred dollars out of Miami. Just if you're coming from the U.S. or like if you're coming from Canada, yeah, you got to get to Miami. This is not hard, not expensive, right? Make it happen. If you're talking about life changes on the scale, that hundred dollars to get here and find out some things. Yes, come down immediately and start making some of those decisions. That's why we say just get on a plane. So often that's the answer. Well, I want to do a bunch of research. No, you know it's safe. You know it's cheap. Beyond that, everything else is like conjecture, opinion. You know, I like the food. Maybe you don't. I like the culture. Maybe you don't. I like the music. Maybe you don't. I like the nightlife. Maybe you don't. Come down and find out. It's going to be the fastest, cheapest, most effective thing. Of course, keep watching my videos. That goes without saying. But beyond that, hop a plane. That's the answer. Now, if you're looking at a Thailand, I understand the price goes way up for that flight. The, the, you know, the time it takes, the commitment just to go visit it, go way up. But it still is very important. You need to get to Thailand and walk around for at least two weeks and say, is this a place that I would feel excited to be living? Or at very least, comfortable enough that if it's the wrong decision, okay, give it a year, give it a two years and move on. And of course, you can always move on immediately. You're not actually trapped like people's brains like to make them think, but it's going to be an expensive mistake if it's completely the wrong place. If you get to Thailand and you're living out of backpacks and you say, you know what, it's just a little bit wrong. I'm going to go try Laos. I'm going to go try Cambodia. <laughs> That's fine, right? Cross the border, not a big deal. Take a bus, whatever. But if you're like, ah, Southeast Asia doesn't work for me. What was I thinking? I need to be in Africa, 
that's going to be a really expensive hop to do again for most people. Again, if you have millions and millions of dollars, it doesn't matter as is always the case, right? But for normal people within any reasonable realm of income, these things can be pretty, uh, pretty expensive to make mistakes with. So you want to, you want to think about that a little bit. So you always go out and test the waters just a little bit, but that's it. Once you've tested the waters, once you've done that one to three weeks of kind of like travel thing, and it's best to avoid being a complete tourist, but you don't have to, right? If you're coming here to Nicaragua, you want to spend some of that time in Noma Tepe, some of it in San Juan del Sur, a little bit in Granada, maybe see Managua a little bit, right? Just get kind of a little bit of a feel, but still do touristy things. Not a huge deal. You're going to see a bunch of the country. You're going to, you know, experience quite a bit. Of course, daily life is going to be quite different, but you should be able to figure out enough to know if it's like, oh, I can't do this, or I'm, I'm really interested. I want to give it a year. Okay, great. Once you're to that point where you're seriously looking to give digital nomadry, expatting, those things a try, then we switch from you've got to test it out. You don't want to make this huge leap without uh, knowing that you can handle it to now you can't inch your way in. And here's why. Okay. So I know it's tempting. The emotional feeling we all have is I just want to put my toe in. I want to see if it's going to be good. I want to see what it's like living there. But the reality is, is if you only come part time, as many people do, you're never going to actually experience living in Nicaragua. This could be good or bad, right? On the good side, it could be, well, you never have to worry about uh, shipping in like, like me, right? I got a new camera I'm going to get. Am I going to ship it in through a shipper? Am I going to pay extra for that? Am I going to, do I know someone who's coming from the U.S. sometime soon? Should I have them bring it? Do I fly up to Miami and grab it? Like I, those are just things that I have to deal with. And if you're just coming and going every couple months, you don't have to deal with those things. You just do all your shopping for those kinds of things in the U.S. And you do your shopping for things that make sense in Nicaragua while you're in Nicaragua. And basically, you'll never even think about it too much, right? It's more like being on a continuous vacation. And you're not going to have to worry about getting and keeping a house through all the seasons. And you're just going to have a short-term rental somewhere, right? It's going to cost more. And you're going to, you know, have those things dealt with more like uh, renting an apartment. Or maybe you'll actually rent an apartment. And it'll be a very different thing than if you actually own or, or rent long-term a house. And you got to buy your furniture and you got to buy your appliances and all those kinds of things. So on one side, it's going to make it feel kind of like a permanent vacation. And a lot of aspects about that will be very comfortable. But on the other side, because it's a permanent vacation, a lot of the things that cause you to save money, a lot of the things that become super beneficial by living in a new country, uh, potentially, are going to go away and, and just not exist for you. And you may never even perceive them. And a lot of people live here this way. They never are here enough to experience the actual major benefits of living in a new country. It's more like they're just getting lots and lots of vacations. I got my dog drinking out of the, out of the plant back here. So some examples of that is you're, you're probably not going to be cooking at home that much. You're not going to be able to stock your fridge and freezer and pantry with those long-term items because you're going to be coming and going, so you won't be able to go through them quickly enough. So that's going to be more expensive. You're more, more likely to be out doing stuff at restaurants more often. You're not going to integrate with society nearly as much. The coming and going thing really tends to push you into an expat lifestyle. Even if you choose to live in a barrio, it's still going to have a, well, they're not really here all the time. People will not interact with you in the same way as when you you actually live here. So that could be a pretty big negative, at least as far as discovering what the country is like. What would your life be like if you lived here full time? You won't really get the same feel. Of course, you can start going out to the bar. You can start meeting people. You'll ease into it, but you won't do so. If you're here 50% of the time, you're not going to ease into it at 50% of the pace. You're going to ease into it at 10% of the pace. It's a very different thing. And uh, we know lots of people who do this, and they and they almost always stay very much on the fringes of integrating into society. And little things like learning Spanish. Maybe you already speak Spanish, but if you're looking to learn Spanish, doing it every day and never getting to escape moves you forward quite quickly. But being able to take breaks and, and it really encourages you to be like, well, I don't have to learn that. I only I can get by. Right. It's just all those things encouraged. But when it comes to the cost, this is where it really starts to make a big difference. When you're looking at why do you want to be an expat, not why do you want to be in Thailand or Nicaragua specifically, but why do you want to leave your home country? In most cases, US, Canada, Western Europe, you're coming from a place that's super expensive and going to a place that's not super expensive. That's just the trend, right? That's generally one of the deciding factors to this, especially when we're just talking about it in a general sense. If you're talking about why did you come to Nicaragua, we have lots of reasons, right? Oh, time zone, the culture, the food, all these very specific things. But when you're talking about just becoming an expat or becoming a digital nomad, we're really focused on why you're leaving a place rather than picking a specific one. So why you're leaving is often because it's very high cost and not effective for you to keep working from there. It just doesn't do the best things for your lifestyle. Totally understood, makes total sense. So when you're doing that, 
you want the place you're going to to not be super expensive. If you're coming and going, you got all those flights to deal with. You got all that time moving things. Do you have to keep things in both places? Do you have to have stuff that you're taking back and forth? That's a lot of overhead that you don't have to deal with when you live somewhere. Do you, are you getting short-term rentals? Of course, you're going to do that for your first six months, but what about after that? Typically, you want to get a short-term rental only so long, you know, one to six months, somewhere in there, until you can find a long-term rental and make that permanent decision. And not permanent, but, you know, year lease or more. So you start, you know, Maybe you put in two months in a short term, you find a long term that you're interested in, you get the long term, you've got a couple weeks of overlap, you go do all your appliance shopping, you get everything moved in and you start setting up your home, you start making it comfortable, you start making it yours. This is when the cost savings start kicking in, not when you're buying the appliances, but the month after you bought your appliances. Now suddenly your monthly costs are probably fractional compared to what you're used to. Instead of spending We'll just kick out some numbers. $700 a month for a small furnished place, you may be spending $200 a month for a larger unfurnished place on a longer lease where you're now supplying the furniture and such. And so that first month, yeah, you got to spend all that money. Maybe it'll take you two, three months before the savings in the rent is going to cover all the money you spent on those appliances. But that's probably not a big deal for most people. And now you're in a position where you're able to live at home, be super comfortable. You've got the TV you like, the couch that you like, the, the, you know, the, the refrigerator that you like, you got it stocked with food because you're living there. Now you're able to cook at home when you want. You learn your pattern of Pedita's job for delivery or other places that are going to deliver food to your home. You know what grocery stores to go to. You start putting together, well, I go to this grocery store for this and this one for that. You have the possibility of maybe hiring wow. help. This is a big deal. If you're going to be here part-time, hiring someone to clean or cook for you is very difficult. Of course, someone will do it, but you're going to pay a premium because it's not a permanent job. You can't really give that longevity. So it's like, yeah, you want someone to come in for the next two months? Of course, someone will do it, but it's going to cost double, triple what it would normally cost. But if you're here all the time and you have that little bit of extra spending money, which you easily have, right, easy, easily have, then you could have someone cooking for you, making you more efficient at work. You got someone cleaning for you, just making life more luxurious. You have all these options that get really cheap if you live here full time. If you don't, of course, you could hire someone to stay in your house and watch over your house. But now you're paying all that for a place you're not living in. And then you still have to pay for your life back home. Those things add up. That whole back and forth thing basically ends up that you pay a premium in both locations and often pay something while you're not in the other. It's significant going to a single location where you're you're keeping your life at a low cost can save way more than 50%. It could be saving 80%. These are big numbers that we're talking about. And of course, there's all the, the you know, just settling in and feeling comfortable and not having to worry about when you're going to head back out again. That's a big thing. If you're coming is, you know, I know people who every month fly back to their home country to go do a few days of work and then fly back. And that becomes a very big, just mental overhead. I just always know I'm going to be back there soon. I don't really get completely settled in. Of course, they spend most of their time here and they love it, but that constant flight back and forth always weighs on them and makes it then they really don't integrate in the way that, that people who are here do. Now, even bigger, if you're coming from a lot of countries, this doesn't apply to everyone, but definitely applies to Americans. And a lot of Canadians are pulling it off. A lot of Europeans will be able to pull it off. And it varies as to how it works. But for Americans, it's quite dramatic. Once you go all in, once you make that commitment, after 365 days, your first year here, you're going to hit the foreign ta earned income credit on your taxes. And that gives you currently, now this is for Americans again, so every country is a little bit different. Some give you more, some give you less, some do it differently, some won't give you any, some give it to you immediately. It's all over the place, but ma the majority of people coming down are Americans and Canadians. And they have paths to this. The Canadians can talk about all the way that their mechanisms work. For Americans, you basically immediately and essentially automatically get $120,000 per year without having any taxes on that. You make above $120,000 per person, and then you start paying taxes normally. Right, you earn 130,000, you take off 120, you pay taxes as if you earned 10,000 for the year. Great, it's a very good system, it's very straightforward. Everyone thinks it doesn't apply to them. All it takes is spending the majority of your time outside the United States. It's more, it's a little bit more complicated than that. I am going to do a video that breaks that down during a not daily, so it's just for the American audience. But it is incredibly simple once you understand why they're doing it and that they're not doing something weird, right? Everybody is sure that there's all these extremely complicated rules. There are not. It is actually incredibly straightforward. People just don't believe it. And uh, many accountants are completely unfamiliar with it. So just pull up the IRS tax code, show it to them, and you're generally good to go. But that means... 
that if you go all in, yes, it takes a little bit of time. Those first few months are going to be expensive, that short-term rental, buying appliances. But then you get into that long-term situation and you start paying that very, very low monthly cost. You get all that overhead to go away and you start living super cheap. And this is Nicaragua, Thailand, basically anywhere in Latin America, basically anywhere in Southeast Asia, China, most of Africa, even bits of Mediterranean Europe, Eastern Europe, you know, all we have huge swaths of the world that this applies to, right? This is not limited to one country or one area. You get through all that. You get into that long-term rental and you get those really low monthly costs. And then you hit whatever your country has that point where you get that tax uh, credit, however it works. And again, not everybody gets it, but almost everyone gets it. Once you hit that, the amount of spending power that you get by having made the digital nomad or expat decision can be extreme. Those can be giant numbers. It depends how much you tax as you pay. It depends how much you earn. depends on a lot of situations. But for the majority of people, this is where the leap happens, not the initial cost savings. That's huge. But this additional tax benefit of no longer being taxed in your home country is generally just insanely large. And so the buying power that you end up having if you go all in. And the reason for all this is that every step of these things is really, if you dip your toe in, yeah, you're going to get some amount of, oh, I really enjoy going out to this restaurant and I really like, but it's different, right? Oh, there's only a limited number of restaurants that you like. Well, you're not going to notice that there isn't variety because you're not here enough. You're going back to the U.S. and eating at Taco Bell and eating at Jack in the Box and you're getting your variety from that. And then you come back and you're like all looking forward to Gallo Pinto again. But when you're here having Gallo Pinto every day, and you have no other option, well, that's something you need to know. There's negatives you need to figure out. But there's positives that you may not realize. I know people who've lived here for years, and because they never put in the research time, they had no idea that they're overpaying by dramatic amounts on their taxes as they didn't look into that. All these things, you got to put them together and say, oh, you know, is there benefits to, to dipping your toe? Yeah, a little bit. Mostly it's mental. Because remember, you go all in. And other than that buying of your appliances or signing a year lease, you are free at any time to go back anyway. So if you're doing the dip your toe in thing, you come down in one case, it's I'm going to dip my toe, but I'm going to go back and forth every month, every two months, every three months and, and mix it up and still keep one foot in my home country and one foot in my new country. That's going to be super expensive and it's not going to give you all of the, the insight that you should have. But once you're willing to just jump in, you are still in a position where, okay, yeah, you jumped in, but what if it goes wrong? This is the fear. Everyone has this mental block. Everyone has it, right? Like this is universal. We all have this, but if I go all in, I feel trapped. I feel, but you're not. That's the most important part. At no point are you becoming trapped. By going all in, yes, you're going to have to give up the tax benefits, the low cost rent and all that to go back. But all those things are just showing how good it was to have jumped in. Right. It's like you know, we made things so good, it's harder to give them up. Well, that's kind of the point. Right. If you're not giving you the, yourselves those good things, why were you doing it in the first place? Right. So you jump in. But let's say after nine months, after a year, you suddenly say, you know what? I gave it a shot. I went all in. I took Scott's advice. And now I've decided this isn't for me. OK, so just go back. Whether you were keeping one foot in your home country and one foot out or not, your ability to go back is probably essentially identical. But if anything, by having had the huge cost savings of having been in the new country, in most cases, for that time, whether it's a few months or a few years, should give you more financial power. And in many cases, just a world education that may be very beneficial for your work as well. But that's ancillary. But you have this additional buying power by having lowered your cost during that time, that generally gives you actually more power to move back to your home country than if you had stayed there. Think about that. This is a funny mathematical thing. But often, especially in the US and Canada, we find that your financial power is increased by leaving your home country, even if your goal is to stay in your home country. If your goal was to buy a house in Canada, you can buy a house in Canada more easily by moving to Nicaragua, living and saving money by lowering your taxes and lowering your, your monthly expenses. Put that money away in Canada in an investment account. And when you have enough saved up to buy a house, go buy a house in Canada. Had you stayed in Canada, you'd be spending more of that money on your rent, more of that money on your food, more of that money on your taxes. It would make it harder to be a Canadian with a Canadian house, with a Canadian anything, by being in Canada. You actually get more 
by leaving Canada, even if your end goal is to be in Canada. Now, you have to say, if I don't want to not be in Canada, then there's the that factor, right? For <laughs> that's, that's a completely different thing. But when it comes to the finances, right, this is about explaining, because I know you're going to react and say, well, if that's what I want, that's what I would do. We're just talking about the financial power, right? Why it's not a risk to come to a low-cost location for a period of time and give up your ties to your old location because you can always go back. No one really gives up the ability to go back home. That's a myth, and it's not a myth that people repeat. It's just a myth that goes into your mind and gets stuck there, and you feel like you've made this decision and it's one way, but it's not one way. The act of having moved to another country in the first place means you have the power to move again, including going back to where you came from. So that if you really internalize it, should free you from that, I feel trapped in my home country or feel like I have to keep one foot there, I can only dip my toe into a new country. No, do your vacation, make sure that it's going to be okay. And then once you've decided that you need to go farther, you need to actually decide if move, so you got a couple decisions. Do you want to be an expat or a digital nomad? That's the first decision. Is this conceptually something for me? And then the second thing is, do I want this specific country? And so you do your travel, you do your research, you watch my show, uh, and you say, okay, I want to give digital nomadry or expatting a try. Good. And here's the countries I'm interested in. Oh, the one that bubbles to the top of my list. It's Nicaragua. It just happens to be. And now I've traveled there, I've put in two weeks, it's beautiful, I can handle the weather, I know it'll get better over time as I get used to it, uh, it's low cost of living, it's safe, it's got all these great things going for it, I am totally good to take a chance on the next year. I have essentially no risk that I will not want to stay for a whole year. I may want to come back after that year. I may want to stay forever. I may want to go on to another country like Scott Moore from There's Gotta Be Something More and go sample the next country, just like he sampled the last one. All of that works great. You have all that in front of you. Once you've hit that decision point, do the vacation, make the move. Don't delay, put everything in motion right away and make the move. The sooner you do a full-time move, jump in both feet, the sooner you'll have your answers, the sooner you will know, the sooner you will enjoy that life, the sooner you will start having that extra financial buying power. All The longer you delay, in, in almost all cases, delaying simply takes away your power and takes away your enjoyment. You have no actual benefits. People fear change and they look for a way to emotionally minimize change. Not necessarily actually minimize change. Sometimes they actually create change in an attempt to avoid what it feels like change. But when we're being rational, one, change is not something that we should fear. Rationally, change is what gives us benefits in life. Nearly all good things come from change. Almost nothing good ever comes from avoiding change. That doesn't mean you should just change things randomly, but the idea that we are emotionally stunted and feel that change is something to be feared, that is something that harms us. It holds people back. People who fear change rarely succeed. Success comes from embracing change and managing it well, but embracing it as something that benefits you and you should almost always be seeking the next change that makes your life better. But only when you have good evaluation and feel that it will make your life better. And of course, look at your risks. Your risk of moving to a new country, all in, practically zero. Now, don't move into a war zone. Eh, that evaluate carefully. But moving to a nice, safe country with low cost of living, what could go wrong? A number of things. But how bad are they? Probably not bad at all. That's a good risk scenario, right? You have huge risks of staying behind, high cost, probably more danger, uh, bad financial position, higher taxes, you name it, unhappy situation, whatever it is driving you to look abroad. Get to your happy place as soon as possible, and that will help you determine if that is your happy place or if you need to move on and look for your happy place somewhere else. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. As always, I will see all of you tomorrow. And these videos up on the screen, they're not there just for my health. They're there for you to click on. Click on one, and if you don't see one, scroll down and click on one below.